Good afternoon and welcome back to the first annual Culture Symposium hosted by Heritage Education Network Belize. This is our last segment for today. Remember that you can view this symposium on the national channel and Heritage Education Network Belize's Facebook and YouTube page. You can ask your questions at the end of this segment by dropping them into the comment section on our Facebook and YouTube page. Today's last session is on museums and heritage spaces. We have all visited museums or heritage sites before and been mystified by history and culture. The power of museums and heritage spaces lies in their ability to connect people in intricate ways. Heritage spaces can be sites of remembrance and central to living heritage practices. Exhibitions can convey knowledge accumulated throughout human history or present diverse viewpoints and approaches. Museums and heritage spaces ultimately influence how we perceive or how much we value culture, heritage, history, and identity. The presentations in this session will highlight different museum projects and approaches that will hopefully help you understand the need to support a growing and diverse museum culture in Belize. Our first presenter, for this segment is Ilona Smiling. Miss Smiling is a Belizean abstract artist and curator. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in criminology from the University of South Florida and a Master's in Fine Arts in Cultural Creative Industries and Art Management from Taipei National University of the Arts. Currently, she is the curator at the Museum of Belize and houses of culture, where she develops and designs exhibitions such as the Future is Female Artist series, which promotes female artistry in Belize, as well as Belize, a collective exposition, which explores the genres of visual arts through various Belizean artworks held in trust from the National Institute of Culture and History's National Art Collection. Miss Smiling is also an independent curator developing and designing educational exhibits and content for site-specific organizations. We will now hear from Ilona Smiling about art and cultural development in Belize, enhancing museum culture in Belize, a curator's perspective. We now have Ms. Smiling. Hi everyone. So today we're going to be discussing art and cultural development in Belize, and more specifically, enhancing museum culture, a curator's perspective. In this presentation, we will be exploring the barriers that hinders progression in art and development in Belize. Identifying these barriers will provide a better understanding of why investment in the arts and cultural sectors is needed in order to reach your maximum potential in the art field. We will also explore how museums and art galleries can be seen as economic drivers rather than stagnant liabilities. So just a little background on me. My name is Ilona Smiling. I'm the current curator for the Museum of Belize and an independent curator as well. So before we get started, I'd just like to give a little background on what it means to be a curator. Simply put, it's someone who's in charge of managing and maintaining the collections or exhibit in a gallery or museum. As a curator, you're often described as the person who interprets the works of the artisans and breaks it down for the audience. When I mention sometimes that I'm a curator, I get told, oh, the person that hangs paintings on the walls. And uh, while the response is funny at times, it's far from the truth. But I'm rarely, if ever, <laughs> dismayed at the oversimplification of the job, as this attitude also extends to the, the oversimplification of what it means to develop galleries, museums, and other cultural spaces. It might not have a connection now, but from my experience, it has come 
very, it has become very apparent that oversimplifying how business works within the art and cultural sector has led us to have an extremely basic view of the world of art and culture. This unfortunately has instigated a halt in effectively creating a sector that has beneficial economic power in an overlooked but influential sector. During my short but informed career, I've deducted that this boils down to a lack of understanding of the potential careers in arts, culture, and the cultural creative industries. We know that artists and artisans can display their works in, gal in a gallery or museum, but we have yet to explore how developing careers in the cultural creative industries can and should help to catapult the careers of artists and in turn establish an art market within our country. More often than I'd like to admit, I hear the sentence, just put some art in the park or just put some paintings on the wall. Art is more than just beautiful decorations that can sit on your walls. They only get, the only way to get out of this basic and juvenile outlook is to move forward in a new direction, which is exactly what I will be doing my best to do for to break down today for you. Within this presentation, I will also be sharing a design that I developed from my own version of an art and cultural space that exists solely for this purpose. So let's get started. And um, first thing we should be asking ourselves is what are museums? So museums and art galleries across the globe have always been one of the major attraction in most countries. These buildings or spaces, once known as cabinets of curiosities, provided its audience a glimpse into another world by categorizing oddities from unknown lands. In their earlier forms, these museums would display strange creatures or animals from faraway lands, as well as tell some stories of various tradition cultures based on the collector's vast encounters around the globe. Today, museums have a more pronounced definition. In our present day, museums act as an educational outreach that enriches our understanding of life by feeding our hunger for knowledge. According to ICOM, according to ICOM's 2007 definition, museums are a nonprofit permanent institution in service of society and its development. Now, these explanations do give handsome statements on museums. It is very important to note here that some of these objects are the, and artifacts on display in some museums were stolen from their native lands by private collectors, or at least some collections and museums were funded by wealthy aristocrats who made their fortune by exploiting black indigenous and people of color in the past. It is these very colonial legacies currently plaguing museums in Western and European countries today that's prompting museums to rethink its structures and demand and, and it demands active decolonizing in its various systems. Fortunately, the insurgent of voices from various demographics in the art sector have prompted the arts to, art world to halt and redefine itself. Which brings us to museums today. In order to break away and to pave a new way forward, a new definition was proposed, creating quite the controversy in the museum community. This new definition now states that museums are democratizing inclusive polyphonic spaces for critical dialogue about the past and future. So I know you're asking yourself right now, what does this have to do with beliefs? But in order for us to advance our attitudes in museums, we must seek an understanding of the past and future representation of the roles of museums and galleries in our cultural development and historical preservation. So let's bring this to our country now. Museums and spaces in Belize. Belize is home to various spaces and museums. Although these spaces are small, they do provide a space for artists and artisans to display their work. However, the small sizes of these spaces leave little room for artistic freedom and exploration of our culture simultaneously. We are confined to limited spaces. Currently, the Museum of Belize is the only museum operating under ICOM's 2007 definition. 
So as a national museum, the Museum of Belize is a place that creates dialogue within its community. But due to lack of funding and resources, it falls short in providing spaces for artistic development and growth. There is no shortage of Belize and heritage and culture to be found in the museum as well. But the lack of artistic and cultural development is a disconnect between is an indication of a disconnect between art and culture. One way museums can achieve a form of artistic development is by creating revolving art exhibits, specifically Belizean and Caribbean art in our region that constantly explores the changing dynamics in our society. While they are, there are indeed smaller galleries that achieve this responsibility along with the museum, we still have a long way to go in terms of developing art collection for the purpose of documenting, researching, and cataloging. It is important to note that the Museum of Belize is the only museum with an active national art collection, but does not have an active gallery for the purpose of displaying its collection or artwork of contemporary Belizean and Caribbean artists. A lack of artistic space and venue ultimately creates a drought in artistic expression and appreciation in the country. Without a fully functioning art, functional art gallery in the museum or, or a portion of the museum, we fail to make an impact in the art world with our Belizean artists. This also affects the way we educate Belizeans and Caribbean students about art, using only Western and European artists within the context of art education in our schools we fail to provide history and evidence of the achievements of our own remarkable beliefs and artists. Failure to have proper cultural representation leads to a belief that we are unable to achieve such high standards in art. Therefore, attitude towards art remains dormant. So what's the solution? One can argue that we just build a new space, which is excellent, but what would, it, what would that new space look like? And who will occupy these spaces? Given everything we've covered so far about museums and their definitions, are we ready to create another space that limits growth or are we creating a new space to embark on a new journey of art and cultural exploration? And better yet, how is any of this achievable? So rectifying this problem isn't a one-off answer. There are multiple avenues of this sector that needs to be explored and dismantled in order for us to make informed decisions about art going forward. For the purpose of this presentation, however, I'd like to focus on a few areas, which is investments, education and art careers, development of a space, and taking up space. If we are to invest into the arts and cultural sectors, what exactly are we investing in? One proposed idea that I've developed is to create a space that exists for the sole purpose of documenting, researching, exhibiting, and preserving art and culture in a contemporary context. It sounds familiar, but we're going to be doing something a bit different this time. Instead of creating a space that continues to the tradition of only displaying art and culture in reference to our past, let's develop a new ideology of experimenting with the idea of a cohabitation that exists simultaneously amongst artists, culture, and tradition in real time. So here I have just the first concept design that I created for what I had envisioned for a new contemporary art space in Belize. So I designed the concept because I believe that it would be beneficial to our development to provide a space that is specifically catered to the needs of arts, cultural artisans, and the cultural, cultural creative sector. So with the help of some very awesome people, this is one of the newer designs that we came up with. I've been working towards something like this for over, for over two years now. So if there's any architects out there at the moment that would like to team up with me and help me uh, continue designing a new space, that would be awesome. Thank you. Just wanted to put that in there. So instead of taking a stagnant approach to museums and galleries, let's start to think 
out of the box and create a space which allows all avenues of art and culture to be on display simultaneously. So this new space seeks to promote art, arts and cultural workers who are creating new and revolutionary ideas in art today and is creating artistic dialogue inside our communities. Within this space, we can work on developing art collections which can be used as research and documentation that would push forward the basis for an art and cultural education in Belize. In the model, I created and designed various rooms. Of course, this is just my idea of what I like to see or how I envisioned it in my mind. So I created, there, there are three, there's actually three different floor levels. And on the first floor, I decided that maybe we should have this area specifically ded dedicated to children. One section, of course, would be for workshops. It doesn't have to be painting, but it could be any traditional class. And of course, these classes would be taught by cultural practitioners. And on the other side, we have the gallery for the artists. And also on the first floor to the right, we have some office space. And I'll be talking about what kind of roles we have in museums. This is just the first floor layout plans. The second floor is, of course, a gallery that will be dedicated for artists to come in and showcase their work. What we can do with this space is actually make it smaller, make several rooms for different artists so that they're showcasing their works simultaneously, or we just have one big room. This is our floor plan once again. And for the third floor, I left the third floor open because I believe that we can do something a bit more experimental in this area. But the point is we need to have the space available to create the digital art or new media art, any kind of contemporary art that you wouldn't find anywhere else. So on the third floor, I also left available a space to hold any collection that the museum would acquire as well as a conservation room. So that's the that's some of the areas within museums that isn't talked about enough. So now we're going to get into taking up spaces within the museums. Because while it's nice to have a big space, we forget that we need people behind the scenes to keep the galleries and museums running. So, taking up space. There needs to be a greater push in developing educational programs in the art field that extends beyond the courses solely in fine art. A career in the arts and cultural sectors, sectors extends way beyond this, but a lack of understanding of what lies beyond this has greatly impacted the ways in which we view career in art. Throughout my career, I have had the privilege to meet many artists and cultural artisans who have one shared idea, which is more needs to be done. But what exactly does more mean and how can it be achieved? We're still holding on to the idea that one cultural institute like niche is the sole solution. While there are areas in which niche is indeed lacking, the only way to expand upon this is to get involved in order to evolve the existing system or better yet, create a new system that, does, that doesn't work against other institutions, but enhances them. It is time we take up spaces and get involved. The development of this sector does indeed, more, does indeed need more inclusion of community input. And one way to do this is to have our own community take up spaces in primary roles in these institutions. But that is often the area of the cultural industry sector that is overlooked. So what roles can we take up in these existing spaces to come? These are just a few that you could look at and you could decide for yourself if this is something you'd be interested in. We have art history, museum studies, curation, art conservation, art restoration, art and cultural research, 
art management, collection policy and development, architectural design, exhibition design, and of course, art critics. So final thoughts. These are just a few of the positions that are necessary to keep spaces like these functioning. But beyond these definition, what exactly do we do behind the scenes? And what would we be working towards? What would be the purpose if there is one museum in existence? But remember, a new space isn't to provide competition, but to act as another component that works in tangent with other art and cultural spaces. We're developing a new ecosystem of creativity that extends beyond art. We are creating opportunities within the art sector and spaces for those who have lived in the creative field to take up space. Contemporary arts and those in the cultural sector need a space filled with opportunities and research that caters to their needs. Hopefully, I've provided some insights into how this can look or what steps we can all work towards. So these are my final thoughts and I look forward to hearing your questions. But the last thing I'd like to say is when we try to fit our large ideas into small existent spaces that were not developed or created for very specific objectives, we sell ourselves short. We, re we remove areas of growth which further diminishes the advancement that we are seeking. How can we say we want a contemporary art museum but not start the discussion of the importance of art conservators and art historians? How can we say we want to develop the art and cultural sector but we don't want to invest in an actual environment that cultivates this knowledge from the root up? So those are my final questions that I will, my final thoughts that I'll leave with you. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smiling, for that enlightening presentation. We now have Mr. Adriel and Hugo Carrillo. Mr. Adriel Carrillo is a Belizean Maya Mestizo youth pursuing an associate degree in tourism management. He works at the Yu Chan Mul Yash Chash Maya Museum as assistant to the director where he applies his artistic skills in painting, ceramics, and wood art. His Mayan mestizo culture enriches his activities in researching, video production, and preparing the Ischel Medicinal Garden. He wants to be a young cultural ambassador to safeguard and transcend his culture to Belize and other youths internationally. His duties at the museum and skills are qualities that empower him to advocate his tangible and intangible cultural heritage. We will now hear from Mr. Adriel Carrillo alongside with Mr. Hugo Carrillo about when social media meets art and culture. Hello, I am Hugo René Carrillo Cocom, director of the museum U Chan Mul Yashkash Maya Museum. The U Chan Mul Yashkash Maya Museum is a small developing museum nestled in the sugar belt of the Orinjuak district, Belize. We are geographically located at San Lazaro village between Quayo site and the Manai archaeological site, and we are part of the Holpatin Trail. The genesis of the museum started in 2012 with the celebration of the Festival del Pueblo, a festival of the people and for the people. This festival is hosted annually. Its main objective is to advocate, promote, and safeguard our tangible and intangible cultural heritage. Cultures around the world value their traditions, beliefs, and norms that makes them unique. Social media links people. 
around the world regardless of differences and geographical boundaries. At our museum, we are no exception. By using social media, it has brought our Maya Mestizo culture and other different cultures together in the global village. Social media is an important part in our activities in the museum because it promotes the interconnectedness and interdependence of our culturally diverse country. When art and culture meet social media, people communicate and interact with others. Thus, we at Uchan Mulyashkash Maya Museum are well aware of the role and impact it has a value added to our museum since we are inclusive and support our collaborators and participants. Social media has a physical, social and cultural influence and on behalf of our museum we are more gladly to share our experience. Our museum has an artisan group composed of young artisans, men and women. They do, they do various artwork like paintings, embroidery, woodwork, textile, crochet. And as I mentioned, we're inclusive. We also work with other artisans with the surrounding communities. Out of this collaborative work, our museum wishes to introduce one of its members. He is a young man, a young Maya Mestizo, who is pursuing a degree in tourism. He is a pillar of our museum who promotes his arts and culture through social media. He's multitask. He's a self-starter. He's like a turbo engine. He's a reliable team member who visions himself as a cultural ambassador. As a young culture, cultural ambassador who is using social media among its colleagues and our diverse country. Hello, my name is Adriel Alexis Carrillo a young artisan who loves my Mayan culture. I work in the Uchan Mulyashkash Maya Museum doing my unique pieces of art such as painting, fabric painting, wood burning, ceramics, and also video producing. It is known that Instagram and Facebook are icons for people to react and comment on your art. Social media has helped me one step straight forward into marketing my products and creating my audience. Through this platform of social media, I can talk and see the, exp the expressions of the people by placing their comment and emojis in my art. And it plays a pivotal role today in the, in the advancement of technology. I have also met new people through social media who are artists and artisans globally exchanging ideas about our work and I have taken advantage of it. Social media has brought me into light, showcasing my work and I have been approached by people who are very interested into my work. I have seen it very useful and important for artists, for artists by no longer creating a gallery and by simply posting their, their work and receiving donations and inspirations by other people. This year, we will be celebrating our 10th anniversary of the Festival del Pueblo. Throughout this period, we have responded to the cry, to the demand, to the empowerment of cultural identity. People started donating and sharing basic items like pictures, traditional clothing, priceless pieces of artwork that identifies our Maya Mestizo culture. All our exhibits 
were showcased open air. Yes, an open air museum. Our matriarch advised us that opportunities and challenges were ahead of us. We were to plant those opportunities and face those challenges. By 2017, we made a bold step. Culture, community, and conversation through social media. Adriel and I strategically used social media as a platform. By this time, we were also the recipient of the Organización Internacional of Mundo Maya Emblematic Project Awards. We were humbled to receive this award. We were also the recipient of the Organización Internacional of Mundo Maya Emblematic Project Awards. We were humbled to receive such award. Our collaborators and participants were already motivated and immersed into social media. This is where Adriel uses social media as a platform and ensures our museum stands for culture. Adriel uses social media to raise the voices. Adriel uses social media hand in hand with our museum to raise the voices of our communities. Adriel arms our culture and communities and establishes a conversation using social media. Being an artist requires a lot of patience and I use social media as a motivator inspiring me with my work. I take time to do my work 100% well done and if I am not satisfied with my work personally, I will redo it until I feel satisfied with my work. My work at the museum focuses on our Yucatec Mayan culture. For example, sculpturing the Mayan goddess out of clay, um, the sun god and other related images in reference with Lamanai. Other work being done is fabric painting in t-shirt, using the national symbols of Belize and other preferred design for people and what you desire. For me, it is important to see people satisfied with my work and that's what keeps me motivated and to keep on working hard on my work and learning more. And talking about learning, I have been them giving a workshop at Banquita's House of Culture uh, teaching teenagers the basics of painting. There are more activities that I have been invited. For example, I have been asked to join a group of artists to paint a mural for this coming month for our September celebrations. Also, I have been invited, I have received an invitation from a friend across in Mexico living in Morelos, Quintana Roo to teach me more about painting and detailing and as well other techniques in painting. All of these opportunities are of great help for me, for my career and for my future. At Uchan Mulyashkash Maya Museum, we're paving the way to inclusive cultural preservation. The development of our museum brings educational and social improvements as well as economic implications and cultural tourism. Living in our small, beautiful country Belize, among diverse cultures, it makes us unique. The work of our museum goes beyond diligently working in the importance of indigenous identity. Our cultural education is important, hands and minds, with social media in making education more empathetic. 
We need to teach our history, our culture, and heritage. Education means not only learning a history that many are never taught. We need to discontinue on learning attitudes. We need to discontinue on learning attitudes and behaviors that contribute to intolerance. At our, muse at our museum, we embrace education with social media. We are moving forward. Social media has opened doors to our participants, both young and to the elders. It has allowed us to step into the global village with the help of ministries and organizations such as National Institute of Culture and History, Ministry of Tourism and Diaspora Relations, Organización Internacional of Mundo Maya, and the European press from Spain. Social media is unifying our indigenous brothers and sisters from the Mundo Maya and other cultures. Our museum is integrating through social media with historians, artists, anthropologists, archaeologists, and cultural ambassadors across the globe. Social media has brought us closer to educational institutions, students, and teachers both locally and internationally. Social media is helping, along with media houses, whom we are grateful. On an important note, we need to be careful of the advantages and, the, and disadvantages of social media to respect and abide by the good rules. Our museum, Uchan Mulyashkash, is grateful. The goodwill of our people is guiding us to the right direction. Our valuable human resource, with their knowledge in art and culture, social media is paving the cultural bridge. Find us in our Facebook page. Follow our events like the Maya Social War, better known as La Guerra de Castas, Museum International Day, and Dia de Muertos Finados, and our Festival del Pueblo. Follow and support our museum. For you, our pillars of motivation for our participants in art and culture. Gracias, thank you, Yum Boutique, to you all, and to Heritage Education Network Belize. The way how I show my culture is by transferring my culture into art, expressing what I feel and love about my culture. Culture is not transparent if we do not show our nation that our culture and traditions are still alive and practicing it where social media can make it be viewed by many other cultures. Now here at the museum, have been working on the annual festival del pueblo unifying our brothers and sisters as one whole culture now due to the worldwide pandemic we can no longer be physically united but with the help of social media we will be launching our second video on the museum's facebook page unifying all our people virtually social media is important in many aspects of our life and I personally think that within this pandemic it is a platform used as a function in many businesses, NGOs and many others. There are many other events we do throughout the year and we have been forced to use social media and I have been creating and editing videos for the museum and have been learning more since we are all cut up these days now the way i see social media how it works is that it serves as a gateway out to our dreams and prosperity for our career as an artist greetings i am Cindy rivero the community arts coordinator for the banquitas also culture niche I've known Mr. Adriel Carrillo for over five years and I've had the pleasure of working with him for different programs and workshops 
for our community. Recently, we are working together for a chalk art workshop whereby he will be the facilitator and teaching our children how to enhance your skills and abilities in art. Mr. Carrillo is a young, talented artist with a good work ethics and a passion for arts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adriel and Hugo Carrillo, for that informative presentation. Our next presenter is Albert Avila. Mr. Avila was born in Belize City, and he is a graduate of the University College of Belize and Ferris State University. He holds a bachelor's in business administration. His work and love for history and culture started in 2015 when he was hired as a consultant to the Belize City House of Culture and Downtown Rejuvenation Project. During that time, Mr. Avila spearheaded the Belize City Primary School History and Social Studies Competition during the years 2016 to 2018. This event was aimed at developing a love for history among our youth through education and excitement. The second key initiative he led was the Christmas Brockdong Brum from 2016 to 2019. This event was a traditional Creole Christmas festival that included music, dancing, singing, and food. At the end of the Downtown Rejuvenation Project, Mr. Avila realized that we as Belizeans did not have a culture of heritage preservation and that there was a need to build that culture. This realization motivated him to found the Belize National Historical Society Facebook group on June 29, 2020. The Society is now a fast-growing Facebook group for Belizean history enthusiasts with a membership of almost 20,000 members. In the future, Mr. Avila hopes to convert this group to a non-profit organization of the same name, with its main goal being the preservation of tangible heritage. We will now hear from Mr. Albert Avila about the Belize City House of Culture and Downtown Rejuvenation Project. Good day to everyone. My name is Albert Avila and I'm honored to participate in the first annual Culture Symposium organized by the Heritage Education Network Belize. Please join me today as I share with you a project called the Belize City House of Culture and Downtown Rejuvenation Project. The Downtown Rejuvenation Project was a project that had as its aim to first create a product that would improve on Downtown Belize City's socioeconomic integration and secondly, to build that integration with the core competencies of downtown, the historic value, the cultural heritage, the economic activity, and the community. Although the downtown rejuvenation project ended in November of 2020, we need to decide how we will continue improving on the eco-museum product that was created in downtown as a result of the project. Downtown is the birthplace of a large part of our history, and it is important that we preserve it so that all Belizeans will become aware of whence we came. The project involved the preservation of our tangible, intangible, and cultural heritage assets. The purpose of the preservation of these assets is so that future generations, no matter which ethnic group they are associated with, will have a place where they could immerse themselves in the environment and reflect on how we became who we are today. The project was merely 
the first step to install the foundation for an eco-museum in downtown. The next step is for our cultural organizations, entertainers, artists, musicians, tour guides, entrepreneurs, businesses, and adjacent communities to continue to build on what the project has already built. The task for these stakeholders is to ultimately transform downtown into a cultural and historic destination so that the improvement of the socio-economic integration that the creators of the project had envisioned could someday be achieved. Belize City was discovered in 1638 and since that time we have been growing haphazardly and without any plan. And at the turn of the century, all of that had caught up with the city. The government, realizing this, hired a, a company to do an urban development study to see how Belize could become a more cohesive city. The conclusion of that study stated that urban sprawl, lack of land use and planning, ineffective response to climate change, and a lack of socioeconomic integration was causing a gradual decrease in the primacy of Belize City. There has been a deterioration of the fabric, the urban fabric capacity to address present and future demands of its citizens. If nothing was done to rejuvenate the city, the city could become dysfunctional. The solutions were, apart from redefining and improving on the urban infrastructure and fabric of the city, there was a need to rediscover the true value of Belize City. The study recommended 16 projects, one of which was a downtown rejuvenation project. In order for us to have the same idea of where downtown is located, let us take a closer look at where downtown is located for the purpose of this presentation. When we refer to downtown and the scope area of, downtown, of the downtown rejuvenation project, we are referring to all that area between the Swing Bridge to the north, Yabra Bridge to the south, East Canal to the west, and the foreshore to the east. Why should downtown be important to us Belizeans? Here are six reasons. The first is that this is where some of the first inhabitants of Belize City lived around 1661. Second, downtown was a seat of government before there was Belmopan. Third, downtown possesses the highest concentration of historic sites in the entire country. Fourth, downtown was once the center of economic activity, and it is still today. Fifth, downtown was always the center of community gatherings. And sixth, it could be considered the cradle of the Creole culture. One of the dilemmas Belize City was experiencing, according to the 2010 study, was that Belize City's residents were moving out of Belize City. Belize City is one of the few cities in the world where residents were moving away from the main urban center instead of towards it. One of the solutions was that we should try to improve on the socioeconomic integration of downtown. But what is socioeconomic integration? Let us look at two of Belize City's parks as an example. Both of these parks have had considerable investment in their infrastructure. But what does DigiPark has on the left that Memorial Park does not have? If you said people, you would be correct. We could say then that DigiPark has achieved social, socioeconomic integration and Memorial Park has not. The original plan was to refurbish government house property and install a marina. By doing this, the implementers believed that this would have encouraged more visitors to visit downtown. However, Taiwan ICDF, the lender of the loan, recommended that we should include a larger area 
that being the entire downtown. By doing that, we could, we could have built on the core competencies that downtown had to offer to attract visitors into downtown. But why was downtown chosen as the area to create a destination that would attract more people into the city? Well, to understand this, let us look at an analogy. Downtown Belize City is like a pile of firewood in your backyard. That firewood takes up space and it might not be a pretty sight to some people. However, that pile of firewood has what I refer to as latent potential, meaning that it only needs a catalyst to help it release its potential. In the case of the firewood, all we need to do is to add some lighter fuel and fire and that pile of wood will cook your dinner, keep, your, keep you warm on a cold night or day, and you could create enough power to move a locomotive. Well, downtown is like that pile of firewood. All we need to do is to release its latent potential of historical value, cultural heritage, economic activity, and the community. The catalyst that will be used to release the energy in downtown will be the creation of an eco-museum in downtown. The vision for the downtown rejuvenation project was to improve the socioeconomic integration of downtown over the next five to 10 years. So how are we going to achieve our vision of socioeconomic integration in downtown? To repeat, we were going to do that by building on the core competencies that downtown had to offer. Those were the historic value, the cultural heritage, the community, the economic activity, and I would add one more, the geography. The broad aims and objectives of the project were the improvement of our national historic legislation, increasing our awareness of our cultures and self-identity, increasing our willingness to preserve and protect our historic and heritage buildings, increase our public spaces, and the enhancement of downtown's physical in infrastructure. Like most projects, the downtown rejuvenation project was divided into two components, hard components and soft components. There were three areas that made up the project soft component strategies, and they were community capacity building, creating an oral history program, and establishing an eco-museum concept in downtown Belize City. There were some benefits that were to be achieved under the project. Under the soft components, the benefits were to increase Belizean awareness, knowledge, and appreciation of their historical heritage, increase our willingness to preserve our heritage, and increase our willingness to protect our heritage. Under the hard components, to support the change towards better security and a friendlier environment for residents and visitors, and attract more economic activities and contribute Let to us look at some of the beneficiary targeted of the project. They were going to be owners of houses to be renovated, residents of downtown, Belizean citizens, the Belize City Municipality, businesses in downtown, and tourists, both foreign and domestic. There were two strategies under the hard components. There were three projects under the first strategy. The first was the restoration to the government house buildings and grounds and a new building for the House of Culture. Government House was the original House of Culture. However, after 206 years, it had gotten too old. So it was decided that it would be best to have the government house do a more mundane type of service, such as converting it to a museum. Therefore, the training of dancers and musicians 
will be conducted in a new house of culture building. The third project was a rebuilding of the Courage House, which became the new office of Minch. The second strategy under the part components was divided into two categories of projects. The first was the restoration and rebuilding of selected heritage buildings within the downtown area, and those included the Belize Heritage Plaza, the Women's Department Building, St. John's Anglican Cathedral, the Ronald Greenwell House, and the Courthouse Building. The second strategy was the redesigning of selected public spaces, and that included Mule Park, Battlefield Park, the Yabra Basketball and Football Field, and the Yabra Cemetery. Okay, so far you've heard uh, the vision, the mission, the objectives, the aims, the strategies the, of the hard components of, and the soft components of the downtown rejuvenation project. But how are we going to draw visitors into downtown, you might ask? Well, we were going to accomplish it by transforming downtown into a destination, by utilizing the eco-museum concept. But what is a de destination? By definition, a destination is a place that people will make a special trip to visit. Therefore, downtown would have become a historic and cultural destination, and we would have utilized an eco-museum concept to achieve it. What is an eco-museum? Simply put, an eco-museum has to be experienced. It is a dynamic way in which communities preserve through local participation, interpret and manage their heritage with the aim of enhancing the welfare and development of their communities. Let us look at four attributes of an eco-museum. The first is that although there could be an indoor museum within an eco-museum setting, the eco-museum is basically an outdoor instead of an indoor museum. The second attribute is that the display would be dynamic and interactive rather than passive, which means that there would be interaction with the visitors. The visitors would be encouraged to participate with the artisans in the display or through workshops. The third attribute is very important. Because these days, uh, our tourists are becoming very complex. They don't only want to be entertained when they come to our destinations. They want to be dazzled. And for us to, to dazzle our visitors, we need to let them involve all of their five senses. Currently, most of our guided tours only let our visitors use their sense of sight and sound. But in an eco-museum, visitors would use their sense of taste through culinary cuisines, smell by the fragrances emanating from local urban gardens, and touch by participating instead of only viewing. In this way, visitors would have a more holistic and unforgettable experience. So far in this presentation, we have presented uh, the infrastructural part of, of the project, and we presented the social part of, of the project. But the project is about increasing socioeconomic integration in downtown Belize City. So the other part of that equation is the economic part, right? And, and that brings us to the fourth attribute of our eco-museum. And the attributes that can be derived from an eco-museum in downtown are increased economic activity, increased businesses, increased employment, increased spending power of the community, increased security for residents and the community, better environment in the downtown area, increased revenues for the municipality. In 2019, right across the river, 
from the downtown area. Our cruise ship terminals brought in about 900,000 people. Around a million people came on cruise ships. Of those million, 600,000 actually came on land. Most of, uh, most of those tourists, almost all of those tourists were taking in bus, cars, boats, taxis, vans, and they were taken all over the country. Very few of them stayed in downtown Belize City because basically there was nothing there to really attract them to go into downtown. But let's say we could really get this eco museum going in downtown Belize City. And we could attract maybe 100,000 of those million tourists. This is after COVID, once tourism gets going. And the average of those tourists is about $140 per day they spend. So if we could get 100,000 tourists to spend $140, um, dollars. I think that's about $14 million per year. And over 15 years, that would be about $240 million. That's $240 million that downtown Belize City never had. And we could actually achieve that by completing our eco-museum concept in downtown Belize City. In conclusion, our eco-museum concept in downtown could become the creation of an area where all Belizeans could immerse themselves in our various ethnic groups, cultures, and in so doing, help to bridge the segregation gap and preserve our democracy. Thank you, Mr. Avila. We will now move on to our question and answer segment. We have our presenters available to answer your questions. Remember that you can drop your questions into the comment section on our Facebook and YouTube page. And while you're there, don't forget to follow us at Heritage Education Network Belize on Facebook and YouTube. Let's bring on to the panel Mr. Albert Avila, Mr. Adriel and Hugo Carrillo, and Miss Ilona Smiling. All right, so this is the interactive part of our segment where we ask some questions. We have some questions here. The first one is from Sal Sarah Clark de Reza. And this one is directed to Miss Smiling. It reads, thank you for your presentation. The design for your proposed art space is gorgeous and ambitious. I very much look forward to visiting it one day. I wonder, given the existing limitation of spaces in Belize that are dedicated to contemporary art, what do you think about the role of outdoor temporary or public art might be in advancing the position of contemporary arts in Belize? Similarly, what about the role for arts and cultural institutions for bringing contemporary art to, oh, Seems that the question trails off a bit there. Do you need me to repeat the question for you, Miss Smiling? You're muted, Miss Smiling. Can you kindly unmute yourself? Thank you. Um, you, you broke up, so I didn't hear the question fully. Okay. All right. So the question is, given the existing limitation of spaces in Belize that are dedicated to contemporary art, what do you think about the role of outdoor, temporary, or public art might be in advancing the position of contemporary arts in Belize? 
All right. Um, I do believe that temporary or public art does indeed play a very important role. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but we used to do the street art festival. And I know that always gave every artist the opportunity to come out and showcase the work that they're doing. And I'm also for businesses who want to include artists within their, their walls or, you know, I've always said this, uh, Every time I walk into some of these stores, I see them selling prints or designs from somewhere else. And it's very pricey. And I think to myself, imagine if we would spend that money on buying original art from actual artists, or if stores would encourage partnership with artists to produce printouts of their work. I mean, that is that to me is more beneficial than anything else. But yeah, I definitely do see a very important role for doing temporary art spaces. We're also trying to see if we can do that as well, where we could set up small galleries for artists to come in and showcase their work. But again, when it's just temporary, as soon as the exhibit is over, then the feel is over. There is no movement. There is nothing there for the artists anymore. It's always the entire feeling doesn't start up until a new exhibit has been created. And I, I, as an artist as well, it's, it's a complicated feeling knowing that there is a long period of time before a new exhibit is created. So instead of just waiting or instead of just doing temporary spaces, I'm always pushing for an actual space that exists just for us, you know, for art. And uh, I, I saw that you have another question, Ms. Sarah, here about the roles of institution bringing contemporary arts to education. Again, I think one of the downfalls we have is that without a space that helps you contribute to a collection, we don't really have anything to research on. And that research, especially curatorial research, leads to the development of art education. Here at the museum, I have tried my best to do uh, some form of art education. We did an exhibit a couple of years ago that spoke on the different genres in art, but what we did was we focused only on Belizean artists. So um, again, if if we had a spot that that was just created for the sole purpose of pushing art and art education, a lot of these things would come a little bit more easily to us or the, the entire experience would be a little bit more enhanced. I hope I answered that correct or just a little bit more clarity. Thank you, Ms. Smiling. Would anybody else on the panel like to add something? Um, I would just like to suggest that perhaps um, the, um, the renovated government house uh, currently, as part of our project, that was uh, supposed to be a museum inside the, the government house. And currently, the, the building has been restored, um, but there's nothing in there. And because of COVID, it's very unlikely that we won't have anything in there for a while. Um, and there's, no, there's not much money to, to do something like that. However, you know, artists, we still have artists. Artists are painting. Uh, there is space, I can tell you, there's a lot of space in the government house. It's renovated and it's beautiful. Let's get some artists in there and let them showcase their, their, their work. So there is a space right now and they, we just need to, to utilize it. Thank you, Mr. Avila. We have some further questions here. We have a question from Ms. Lucy Burns. Concerning Ms. Smiling's presentation, do you believe that because of the minimum interest from the citizens of Belize in its history, that there hasn't been plans for a new larger museum as yet? So while the question is directed to Ms. Smiling, I think everybody here can chip in a little bit on this one. Hi. Um, I don't think that we have 
minimum interest. I just, there's a lot of our history that needs to be uncovered. And from, from, from my experience, there is still only a handful of people within that sector that are, that are doing their best to uncover such a vast array of history that exists within Belize. Um, that most definitely would play a part in, in why we don't see the need to build something new for us. Uh, I know Mr. Avila is saying that we should use government house and while that is nice, again, I still don't see why we have an issue investing and developing something specifically for art and culture. Um, I, I, I hope I'm not, you know, pressing on any toes here, but if we could invest millions of dollars in new buildings for businesses, shopping marts and hotels, why can we not do it for a contemporary art museum? Specifically for that, for us not to be used for any purpose, not for renting or something else, but just, just for art. And again, building something like this, it will always, it, it will also uh, encourage a new career within the cultural creative industry like i said in my presentation we have careers in art art history museum studies exhibition designs curation conservation where would we find space for that in government house if we're going to fill all the walls with artworks these are important elements that need to be discussed and developed in order to push forward art and culture. So I, I guess that it, it does indeed answer Miss Luce's question, you know. There, I wouldn't say that there's minimum interest in history, but there's still a lot to be, uh, there's more to be discovered within our history. And it is because we're still looking at it in such a small bubble, we still think that we can just put something in one random house and call it a day. No, we need to do more. We need to start pushing more. We need to develop it. And with every development of a new building like this, again, you need to push the education that goes on behind it. I know that sometimes for me as a curator, it is a bit difficult because I have my hands in so many projects. And I, it's, it, it takes a toll on you when you know you can't give your best to everything all at once. And I always said, imagine if I had an entire department of curation working with me to get projects off the floor how much how much more exhibits would we not have been able to do by now but it's just me and again i i can't say enough there needs to be a push we need to do more we need a building mr albert i'm so sorry we can't do government homes i'm not done for it you know i i do i do agree with uh ayuna because at the end of um, our project last year, maybe September, October, um, this was before COVID. And um, we were looking at a follow-up project for the downtown rejuvenation project. And I had always told um, Taiwan when they came for their, their evaluation in December, 2019, that our project needed a follow-up project. And um, because our project was more of an infrastructure uh, hard components project. All the money was invested there. Now we have the buildings. We are we are repurposing the buildings now. Um, so we needed another follow-up project to invest in the culture, in the museums, in, in that sort of intangible, tangible um, assets. And I had proposed um, a building, a five-story building um, in that property right after the Greenwood property, that open building, that property right there. And they were considering it. Well, at least the ministry was considering it, but uh, COVID came and COVID just threw, threw off everything. But I do agree that um, we do need more places, physical places for museums. And not only in Belize, but all over, all over the, um, the country, all those villages need their little museums to showcase what they have, their history. And that is the only way we're going to be able to to keep to keep our culture and keep our history, if we are displaying it and we are and we are showing it uh, to to the new generation, because we are not showing our history and our culture to the new generation, and that's why I was motivated to create the um, 
the Belize National Historic Society, because we, we need to keep people telling, we're not doing oral history as such, we're doing more textual history now, because people are doing posts and making comments about the way things were in the past. But we do need a physical place that we can showcase all of these, um, all of these things. Thank you, Mr. Avila and Ms. Smiling for those remarks. We have a question here directed to Mr. Adriel and Mr. Hugo Carrillo. How can we Belizeans participate in events done at the museum? If so, how can we be informed of the events and their date? So, uh, for the question for Ms. Reina Castro, well, um, since we are a museum that, uh, that is inclusive, for we, technological we reasons, can we ensure we all from, have our mics our turned off? People. So, by being inclusive, Mr. Carrillo, we're having trouble hearing you. We seem to have some technological challenges here. Are we still having the same problem? Yes. If Mr. If Mr. Hugo and, and Mr. Adriel, if you are connected from the same space, it might be helpful to connect from one device. Okay. Um, oh, I'm excellent. Sorry we can hear you that. much better now. Go ahead. Problem. So, back to the question for Ms. Reina Castro. Um, since, as I was saying, since we are an inclusive museum, we do help uh, help from other people around the, the country. So, um, it is very, um, for me, it is very, a very uh, um, happy, it makes me happy to, to to see a question that Belizean people are interested in the culture and that they're willing to help our culture. So in finding Facebook Museum page as Uchan Mulyash Kash, we, we post our events and our, our dates in our page. So you can always find it there. And as well, it is, it is leave a message we get your emails so that we can also send send you the dates and um, all the different events that is happening throughout the year. So um, as well, you can you can use our number, uh, our phone number, which is six six one nineteen eighty. That is the the um, number for the director of the museum. You can always um, give us a message. Uh, you will be definitely be you will be being will be being a part of the of the events. So um, you can always be um, be helping us out.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Carrillo. There is one question that I think we can address to any of the panelists regarding our youth. The question reads, uh, is it difficult to keep, and here I am reading the younger generation or younger artists, younger generation, interested with the new developments of technology and teenage interests nowadays. So in your experience um, as curator, as a history enthusiast, as a museum uh, curator, uh, how, what is your experience with the younger generation and keeping them interested in the arts and heritage? I guess I'll go first. Um, from our experience, it's, I wouldn't say that it is difficult. We found that whenever we do have our after school, after school programs or our summer art programs, we do get a lot of young, younger kids or younger artists who are very excited to participate within our programs. I've always said that technology shouldn't be seen as the enemy. enemy. It's something that could enhance your experience. And from what we've noticed, um, some of the older children, I guess you could say, uh, if they make something that they're really proud of, they want to take a photo quickly and they want to put it up on Facebook. They want everybody to see it. They want to put it on TikTok, Instagram. And, you know, it, it works as their little online community where they could share the work that they have been doing. So I wouldn't see that. I, I, I personally don't see the development of technology as an enemy. It, it is most definitely a tool that can be used to enhance the, the work that you're doing. You could showcase it and, again, like I said, develop your own community, your online community. Thank you, Ms. Smiling. Do we have any other remarks from Mr. Carrillo, uh, Mr. Adriel or Hugo Carrillo, perhaps as uh, social media enthusiasts? Mr. Hugo, I believe you are muted. We cannot seem to hear you. You hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Um, in regards with working um, with younger artists, um, the teaching the ways um, how to keep them interested. Uh, and there are two things I would like to mention. To start is that our museum is located at San Lazaro Village in the Orange Walk District, which is a rural area. And two, our surrounding communities and schools and even the youth who are not um, in, a, in an educational institution, a, our museum serves as a bridge in our community and with other communities. Now, we have seen that there is a, is a passion for our youth especially because they want a platform. And that platform is not only social media, but they want something, a good foundation. And I think our museum with social media combines and is making that bridge, that cultural bridge within our Maya uh, Mestizos uh, youth. Not only that, but we have seen that it's a bridge because they're communicating now with other youth across, for example, Yucatan, Quintana Roo, and even Guatemala in all the Mundo Mayan countries. And this has, and this is expanding. This is expanding because then afterwards we get other people from different countries and different cultures. So the only, the only, um, there is one strategy 
that when we said that we will communicate and we will convey using social media, because we had to find this platform, because the youth are interested in something that will not only would promote them, but they have to be part of promoting and advocating and give them something substantial. And I think that the museum and museums um, across uh, Belize or houses of culture, we need to recognize this youth to keep them and empower them. It doesn't matter which culture you are. And I think um, what we are doing is, is a steady space and little by little, uh, we are growing and we have seen more interest and it's a bridge between the youth and the elders because the youth teaches the elders and uh, with social media and even now the elders are teaching the youth of their cultural uh, heritage, cultural traditions, folklore and things like that. So this is our experience at our museum. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carrillo. And we have space, well, time for one more question. This question is from Gabriel Hulse. I am all for urban planning, and I wish more municipal governments included it in their manifesto. But I'm curious how we can encourage urban renewal without delving into a slippery slope of gentrification. For example, if we want to transform downtown into somewhat of a dazzling tourist destination with increased economic activity, more than likely catering to those foreign visitors, how do you think we can ensure that we don't also end up indirectly displacing residents and local livelihoods? Mr. Avila, I think that that question might be directed to you. Well, the, uh, the idea was that the, the residents and the uh, businesses in downtown um, would not have been affected by by the project. They, it, it was completely the opposite because the idea was to to bring tourists, well, not only tourists, but visitors, because we also wanted to attract local Belizeans to come. But when, when you look at the economic activity, the people that were going to spend the money in downtown, then you had to include the tourists because they were the ones that had the, the, the finances to come down and, and, and spend. So the idea was not to displace anybody, but to actually bring new businesses into downtown. Because one of the one of the problems we had we've been having all along before the project started was that there was some sort of a standoff. Why nobody went into downtown? Because you you couldn't get the local businesses and entrepreneurs to go into downtown and say, okay, let me put in recreational and entertainment facilities when nobody was coming into downtown. Yet you couldn't attract people into downtown because there was none, there was no recreational and entertainment facilities. So there was basically a standoff. Nothing was happening. Belize, Belize downtown remained the same, sort of in a quandary. So the, the Eco Museum now, the, the concept was to bring the Eco Museum into downtown and let that be the, the catalyst to bring the people into downtown. And once the, the people, the visitors started to come into downtown, then the businesses, the entrepreneurs, the business people that were already there in downtown, the residents that were already there, because a lot of residents that were living in downtown, they were the ones that actually have the businesses. Right? So then they would start to invest because we had the supply, we had the demand, which would have been the, 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 the cruise ship tourists that were going to come into downtown. And that was the idea to start the, the economic activity, this economic activity wheel turning. So it, it was detrimental that we, we encourage the, um, the, the businesses and the residents that were already there to invest into downtown. And also we needed new, new people to come into downtown because if you look at downtown now, halfway on Albert Street, there's nothing. All the businesses that were there, the different types of businesses we had in the 50s, 60s and 70s, those are all gone. Now only half of Albert Street, we have basically all textile stores. There's no, um, there, there's no tanning shop, there's no shoe store, there's, 
there is no um, bakery, there is no uh, entertainment in, in, in downtown anymore. So that was that was the idea. And I guess the people that, that, that saw that developed the concept didn't see that it would have worked against downtown, but it would have worked for, for downtown to help it to grow. Okay, thank you, Mr. Avila, for that response and clarification. And that brings us to the end of our question and answer segment. We had lots of questions and we are sorry we couldn't get to your question, but uh, we have elapsed the time for today. So thank you, Mr. Avila, Ms. Smiling, and Mr. Adriel and Hugo Carrillo for being with us today to answer questions from the audience. We will now move on to our closing remarks from our co-director, Ms. April Martinez. Ms. Martinez. Ms. Martinez is co-director of Heritage Education Network Belize, and she will be closing us off today. Thank you, Ms. Rosado. On behalf of everyone here at Heritage Education Network Belize, we want to give a huge, huge thank you to all of our presenters today who participated and helped us make this first day a successful one. Um, thank you, Professor Valdez. Uh, Dr. Sean Morton and Megan for Matthew Brown, Jillian Jordan and Mr. Kong Chong for your wonderful segment of Ancient Maya Archaeology. Our viewers still have questions. Um, a big thank you to Professor Liz Graham, Drs. Tracy Mayfield and Scott Simmons, Drs. Eleanor Harrison Buck, Sarah Clark Teresa, and Adam Keating for steering us in a new direction of historical archeology span in our post-contact release session. We also want to give another big thank you to our presenters in the Collaborative Heritage Research Session, Mr. Zachary Neeson, Ms. Alessandra Villarreal, Mr. Frank Smith, and Dr. Jillian Jordan. I know that our audience appreciates this newfound knowledge that there is truly a space for everyone in heritage research. We also want to extend our sincerest gratitude to Dr. John Spennard and Mike Miro, Dr. Annabelle Ford and Cynthia Ellis Topsey and Professor Lisa Rosero for leading the conversation on the future of archeology span and traditional ecological knowledge in our archeology span today and tomorrow's session. And to our final presenters here right now, thank you for concluding our symposium today with our Museums and Heritage Spaces session. Thank you, Ms. Ilona Smiling, Mr. Adriel and Hugo Carrillo, and Mr. Albert Avila. I believe that we are well on our way to appreciating and reviving ways how we showcase our heritage. Our first day was vibrant and full of participation from the viewers who, without you, this symposium would not be possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. Um, thank you so much to our incredible volunteers who were working tirelessly behind the scenes to bring you this incredible first day. We are also grateful to the National Channel for airing us live on their network and for helping us reach to our internetless audience. Um, and just thank you all who showed up today. Thank you everyone who asked your wonderful questions. And please remember that if you have any other questions, you can always contact us at Heritage Education Network Belize on our Facebook page, Instagram, YouTube. You can also find us at heritagebelize.org. And our presenters, excuse me, our presenters have also dedicated their time to giving us their contacts. So if you want to ask them questions personally, we have that for you too. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, thank you uh, to our, uh, to everyone that worked today. Thank you to our directors. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Linmar Rosado for helping us moderate today. Join us back tomorrow for day two. Trust me when I said the culture not done yet, make sure you're today. See you all tomorrow.